Hello everyone and welcome back to the Captive Raptors podcast with I, your host, Paul. Before we get into today's episode, which is going to be on the Mangrove Monitor, I um, just want to say thank you for all the support on the channel so far and if you leave a comment of something you want to see in the next video or a question that I can answer in the next video because I might try and do a QA, and a but I need people to ask me questions to be able to do a Q&A, a monitor related ideally. But yeah, anyway, Mango, my mangrove monitor, I believe, is in the process of trying to find a place to lay eggs. So she is currently out and digging around. So if you can hear her, I'm sorry, but I'm not because I'm hoping that she lays eggs and I'd rather that than people listening to this. But anyway, we're going to follow the same... Um, it's quite late, it's like 11 o'clock at night and I'm tired, but I've got another time to film this. So we're going to follow the same... Um, schedule as we do for all the podcasts this is number five maybe six um we're going to do an overview overview of the species sorting your mangrove monitor the setup heating and lighting humidity food supplements enrichment um socialize socializing and i'm we struggle with that and then we're going to touch on um breeding and cycling i've never bred them but i have got them to cycle and like i say i think she's um Imagine if she was just laying an egg now, that'd be crazy. Um, so yeah, we're going off my higgle, higgledy piggledy notes again. So if I'm not looking at you, I'm sorry. But I'm hoping that you're just listening to this rather than watching it. If you're watching it, this is I. Anyway, podcast. Piranha Indicus. These guys are part of a group called the Indicus Complex. But this complex is big genus there's a lot of monitors that are under the indicus complex and they are that some of them come into like northern australia but they're a complex of monitors that are um is it archipelago in the archipelago sort of um indonesia papua new guinea they fill that sort of niche um i'm gonna try and read out all the latins now so in the indicus complex there are obviously Varanus indicus who we'll be focusing on today Varanus dorianus, Varanus finchi, Varanus jobiensis, Varanus cab cab in violin cab cab rule in violin violins. Don't know. Carol. Carol of Islands. Carol of Islands. There we go. Finally got it. Ceram <laughs> uh, boniensis. Uh, Juxta indicus. The Luringenensis. Lur- I'm not very good at Latin, as you can tell. So we're just trying to skip over that one. Uh, <laughs> um... The Rainer Gunferi, the Obor, the Zagorum, the Uanawi, Melinus, and the Coli. Um, that may have changed. I've sort of looked around to try and find what was in the complex, and it's not a lot out there, really. So that may have changed. Some have been reclassified, hired up. Um, there is also an underlined heading of, like, confused monitors in that group of Dorindicus and Dwari. Um... But there's so many islands out there and there's so many different like variations in said species for them to actually classify them as what they are. So the taxa may or may not have changed if it has. I'm sorry if it hasn't. Look at me and know what I'm talking about. But we're just going to focus on Phrynus indicus. Um, the locales as of what I've studied of actual indicus. Again, this could be wrong, but this is just what I've researched. So not where they're from, because they're from different places, but the same locale could be classed from two places. So you've got a Sarong locality, a Wago locality, and a Rue locality, a Solomon Island locality, which is what I've got, um, Marina Islands locality, and a Kai Island locality, as well as a Papua New Guinea locality and a Northern Australia locality. I believe the Kai Island may be different of might just be still indicus but kai island mangrove monitor um but yeah they're found throughout indo you can even find them in timor for example um but there isn't a timor locality or at least not a described one 
Um, but yeah, so if you've got a dark, dark purple tongue, the spots that will take up scalation of around five or six scales, little yellow spots, um, they've got no vertical lines on their um, dorsal, and they have a clear throat, not pink, then the chances are you have Rana Syndicus. Great. I'm going to keep looking back just to see sort of what she's doing because if I can catch her laying an egg, I'll cut this podcast now and do a filming. But yeah, so um, these guys, mangrove monitors, they're found in mangrove swamps, jungle, rainforest, deep rainforest. Um, they'd be used to brackish water. I've noticed my guy coming out of water and sneezing. Being in brackish water, they'd probably do this to get salt out of their nostrils. Um, but obviously we don't have any salt in captivity. And also, just a quick touch as well. If you notice that your Indicus has bloody gums, so like blood in its mouth, don't worry. It's common of the Indicus complex because they've got such sharp teeth that they can make themselves bleed. Um, just from sort of sitting there and looking pretty, to be honest. But these guys, the males tend to get a bit bigger, bulkier forearms. Um... Males tend to have a bit more of a rounded snout. Females tend to have a bit more of a pointy snout. Um, males can get up to four foot if we're talking Solomon Islands. Some locales can get bigger. And females can get between three and four foot. My female is... She's probably just under two and a half foot. I don't know how old she is because she would have been well caught. But I've had her for nearly two years. And she hasn't grown much. So I'm imagining she's around four or five. Um... So yeah, let's just pretty much just get into these, really. My mangrove monitor is hands down my favourite monitor. No questions asked. She's she's amazing. She's great. But at the same turn, she's the hardest monitor that I care for. Um, she's evil. She's straight from hell itself. She will bite at any given opportunity. She is not tamed down at all. She tongue feeds. She's bold. She's cycled for me. I'm not worried about having a cuddly mangrove. Don't get me wrong, I'd love one. But if you're getting into a mangrove monitor as your first pet monitor, pff, contradicting what I said on my other podcast on best pet monitors, but don't. They're not for the faint of heart, let's put it that way. You can get them from babies as imports, and if you can get them, we'll get that onto so um, sourcing. We're going to, uh, we'll cross over. If you get, a captive bred baby cool in the uk good luck you're not finding it i don't know about europe america shout out to kaifan mango mangrove king um i know there's a few other guys that are getting eggs so good luck to them i wish the species all the best but yeah get a captive bred baby you'd be able to socialize it it's a different ball game but if you get a wild caught import or captive farmed it's exactly the same the chances are that animal is going to be either A, so scared that it appears tame and it's just petrified. And the chances are you haven't got it hot enough or you haven't got it set up properly. And it's just in this dormant zombie stage. Or it's going to be incredibly skitty and flighty. And you're just going to be going in there chasing it like a madman trying to grab it. Going, oh, why is my mangrove so flighty? Just leave it. Let it settle in. Like, make sure the worst thing you can do is get a monitor that's probably got a high parasitic load and you're going to go in there and scare the absolute hell out of it. And then it's going to, like, absolutely brick it and it's chances are you're going to have a dead mangrove. Just leave it, let it settle, gain its trust, start to work on that, like, on its terms. Like I say, Mango, she, she hates me, but I'm cool with that because I've pulled her from the wild, not on purpose, but... I pulled her from the wild, and she, she didn't ask to be here in a box. I'm keeping her in a box, so the least I can do is make her as comfortable as possibly, possibly can while she's in a box. Um, just make sure I don't miss anything. But yeah, the teeth, I touched on it, because the bloody gums. The teeth are no joke. I haven't received a mangrove bite, but it is medically significant. If you get caught properly, you'll need stitches. If you, I'm an electrician, I work with my hands. That's me off work. I'm self-employed. I can't afford to be off. So again, I don't force anything with her. And if I want her out of the viv, I'll lure her out of food and I'll put her into a tub. So I don't have to grab her or snatch her. Um, so it's all on her terms. She's sort of a following the food into a place of, um, place of haven as such. 
but yeah, they're incredible. Like that's she is so smart. She has escaped three times. She's got on top of the fridge, which is just there at six foot. I came home and I thought she'd been burgled and she'd got out and she knocked all my ornaments off. Um, and when I'm, she squeezed out a two inch vent and I could get two fingers in it, so that's how small it was. And there's this two and a half foot lizard and she squeezed herself for a two inch vent that I'd screwed up and she'd been slowly pulling at it. And she dug herself out of the viv as well in the back corner. Like the actual viv itself had a bit of water damage that I couldn't see. And she found that pinpoint and she dug herself out of it. Um, so yeah, they're incredibly smart. So make sure that you are ready for a toddler that has claws and teeth. Um, but they are mini Komodos. They're stunning. They they have, they have an olive green. Photos of my mangrove does not do it justice. They're one of the most stunning monitors you'll ever see in your life. Like the greens and the yellow contrast. It, I wish I had a tame one. And if I can ever produce a parthenogenic one, because getting a male is going to be quite hard, but if I can ever produce a parthenogenic mangrove, I will do my utmost to make sure that baby's tame. Again, on its terms. But I'd love to be able to sit here and have a podcast and have my, have my shoulder dragon, because they're, they're incredible. But again, on the sourcing, if you're going to get a wild-caught animal... Don't just stick it in a box and have it as a pet. These these animals are having this massive sacrifice for them to actually come into captivity to be kept in boxes. Because let's be honest, that's what we do. You can have the biggest box or the smallest box in the world. It's still a box. You can, We can't replicate the jungle. Captivity is all they know. It's a bit different. Like captive bread is a bit different. So if you are going to get a, a captive farmed or wild caught animal, please try your best to try and breed it. It's the least that you can do for that animal sacrifice. Um... But like I say, as regards to UK, not many people with mangroves at all. Not many people with the Indicus complex at all, which is sad because I they're one of my favourites. But they also take up a lot of space. Um, speaking of space, setup, nice transition. Um, I'll be completely honest. Like I said, I'm going to be honest the whole way through this podcast. I've um, as in the whole podcast, not this, just not just this one. I don't want to try and pull wool over people's eyes. Um, my mangroves in a six by three by three, which was the average size recommended before I got her. And she is, she's probably, she was probably two foot when I got her total length. And she's probably two and a half foot now, two and two foot, four inches, something like that. Um, six by three by three for her. It's okay. She, I rack it out of platforms. So she, I'm using all the space. She has lots of logs she can climb on. She has a big nest box she can dig in. She has multiple basking spots. She has a pond that she can fully submerge and actually go forwards and backwards um, so she can swim. And like I say, she has layers and platforms. So it's not just... Because if you have a six... Regardless, if you've got a 10-foot long cage and 4-foot deep, 6-foot tall. But if you don't use the height, you might as well only have a 6 by 4 by 4 fully decked out. The usable space is the same. I'm not going to condone it. I do think it's too small. When I move, I'm going to build her an eight foot long, four foot deep, five or six foot tall viv. That's my plan. Um, so don't make the same mistake I've made. I can't get rid of her now. I adore her. Um, and she, like I say, she has cycled for me. So she's clearly happy in the setup she's in. Because to what I understand, getting mangroves to cycle is quite hard work. Um, which we'll get into in a bit. But yeah. Definitely go bigger. These guys are incredibly active. They dig, they climb, they swim, they run around the floor. They they they're just so active that they do need the space and they do need that next level care over say an Aki, even though they're same they're both in Veranda. So you definitely need the bigger viv. Um, and like I said, there's no point in me lying about it. I think. Eight foot by four foot by five foot is a good size viv. If you can go bigger, I would definitely go bigger. But that for me is a good size viv. I don't know if you need the full five six foot tall, but I would like a cage big enough that I can get in there and actually sit down in, or ideally walk in, because um, I'm I'm not even six foot myself, so that would be okay for me because I feel like it'd be a lot easier to interact with her in a cage that she actually feels comfortable in. Um, where I'm in her territory rather than having to get her out of her territory to be able to interact with her or try and approach her f between a barrier of my territory and hers. Um, so yeah, big, 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 big vivs. 
Um, if you get a mangrove or something like a Dorianus, this isn't the Dorianus or the Melinus or even the Jobiensis, they get bigger than the mangroves. Um, you probably want a similar size to what I've said, an 8 by 4 by 6 Ideally go bigger because they can get 5, 6 foot long. Some of them, like the Uinawi, can get really big. Um, but my mangrove, she spends probably about 30 to 40% of the time in the water, whether that's swimming, sleeping, chilling. Um, she spends 20 to 30% up high. She'll, there's, like I say, there's two ledges. that One spans pretty much the whole width of the cage and another one's just underneath that sits above the water so she can drop in the water sort of like they would in the wild. Um, just quickly on that as well. It's hard to know in the wild because when you find a monitor in the wild, I've never done it, but I've spoken to people and I've read a lot. When you find a monitor in the wild, they tend to go high. So is their natural state high or do they only go high because they're scared? Is their natural state, are they terrestrial? Are they dwelling on the ground? Or do they... They're obviously going to climb, but are they 50-50? Or do they spend most of their time on the ground and only come up high one to look for food and two when they're scared so let me know in the comments what you think while you're down there subscribe um let me know what you think because it's an interesting it's an interesting theory because she spends as much time in her nest box and buried as she does chilling up high let's put it that way she'll climb around up high and make use of the space but i feel like like i say that's because she's in a box and she doesn't have the option to walk miles on the ground um but yeah make sure that you've got oh we even got it in capitals i'll go over it again escape proof cage because they will escape and they will cause hell and make friends with your guinea pigs and hold them for ransom um what even subject am i on i'm on the setup so we'll go more into that <laughs> um yeah it's water I have a two foot tall, two foot deep, and a foot and a half wide, I think, water bowl, um, which allows her to go fully submerged, swim around sort of at the bottom in a circle as such. It's a bit naff, but it's better than um, it's better than nothing, let's put it that way. So she has a big water bowl that she can, and I have a branch in there so she can hold onto the branch and sleep, as well as I have a little cup, like a deli cup, that I change daily, which is by a basking spot in her nest box. So she can drink from that, pick it up like a human. She can drink from her nest box, um, water bowl, fresh water daily. And then her um, pond water bowl gets changed every week. Um, I change it on a Sunday night. Um, if you don't have a nest box, my nest box in there is three, three foot long, two foot wide and a foot and a half tall, two foot tall, maybe. Um, She's laid in that before, so I think that's good. I will be going to full cage nesting when I move her over. Um, when I say full cage nesting, I'll probably separate half the cage with deep substrate heated. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, she, deep soil is very important because they dig. Her actual cage, she hasn't got that deep of substrate. She's got six to eight inches because that isn't heated. So that's... I don't want it... I want it deep enough so she can dig and enrich herself in it. I don't want it deep enough that she's going to go in there and burrow and get cold because it's not heated. Um, so she's got the big deep nest box, which is heated and is designed to be able to hold a burrow. So I, I have that. It's a sandy soil um, in the nest box and it's sandy soil um, sort of like mulch, like forest floor, cypress mulch chippings on top as well, as well as a lot of leaf litter on the actual cage floor. It gives her something to dig around in. It also allows, with that mulch and that leaf litter on the top, it allows you to get the substrate wet and then the humidity doesn't escape as quickly because you've got that layer of the top of it, as well as for a bioactive setup, which it is. I've got a clean-up crew. Um, no live plants, just clean-up crew. And the leaves break down and a few bits of the wood and stuff break down and the, um, the microfauna can eat that. Make sure you use all the space. You probably see just there. Just, 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 just there. Um, that's a cork tube that's pretty much fixed to the ceiling. So, using all that height as well so she can come, she can chill, she can climb. So I'm making use of the elevated heights. 
Um, that also helps very much so, as Kai fan says, for them to feel secure and comfortable because they can look out at you at sort of eye level as such and they feel like they're above you. Um, I would rather her, again, be in a tall cage or an elevated cage, but I... Um, a bit naive going into it, to be honest. A bit naive going into it. So it's working for me, but I definitely want in the next year when I move, I'm hoping to move this year, so in the next year, Mango is going to have a palace. But yeah, so elevated hides and cork tubes because they do like to wedge themselves in those narrow little cork tubes and they will curl up and sleep in the cork tubes. Climbable walls, again, make use of all the space. So she can climb across all of the walls. She has the layers, she has the walls. It just adds so much more dynamic to a vivarium, regardless of species. Climbable wall is a must for monocle lizards. I've spoken about the platforms briefly, but platforms, it doubles the surface area of the cage almost instantly. It's just a non-brainer. It's just a bit of ply. Two bits of ply in there. It doesn't look amazing. When I deck it all out, when I redo her setup in the big setup, I probably will try and do foam and make it all look nice and stuff, but you don't need to. It it looks good and it... it sorry, it doesn't look good, but it functions very well, and I'd rather functionality over the sake of the aesthetic of the Viv. The Viv still looks as natural as I can get it, but in this instance, I would rather her have this platform. You can put dirt and stuff on it to so it sort of hide it, and I do, but she digs it all off, so I gave up with that. Um, so yeah, and then I have two sort of close under each other so she can get right down into one, and it's really dark and really shady. And in my opinion, when they're in the deep forest, there are going to be patches where the sun doesn't really penetrate as much and it's not going to be dark but it's definitely going to be gloomy in comparison to say an opening or a patch of sun that they found so i've touched on cleanup crew but these guys prolific pooers prolific pooers and it goes everywhere especially the urates um especially when you're feeding them stuff like fish and crustaceans absolute mess so Thankfully, normally it's in the water bowl, so changing that, fine. But if you do get a bit, the chances are before you get in there, the, you've got the beetles and the wood lice and the um, springtails going to town on it. It helps you see it on the dirty floor. Um, I've got that's on my notes, but I'm just going to, um, in there as well, I've got a rock under one barking, basking spot to allow the halogen to heat up the rock and then the rock will heat up and then overnight release infrared heat as well as she gets belly heat from a hot rock when she's trying to digest food and or cook eggs. Um, just something simple like that, as well as um, it's just a different texture in there to help her shed and also just a different texture for mentality. She's like, oh, this feels different to that and she can interact with different things in her environment as she sees fit to. Um, and again, just the deep substrate for the sake of humidity it's, it's a must so but we'll go more into that when we get into humidity because we're on heating and lighting now um so in mango's cage i have two basking spots one is 150 watt exoterra um halogen flood basking light just an e27 and it's in a dome so it spreads so she can sit under this is the one that's above the rock she can sit under that and it will cover the spread of her because she's quite a big lizard and it's important to cover the whole spread of the lizard because if you've got a lizard and you're heating it here with a direct beam, the head and the tail stay cold. So it, the direct beam needs to stay hot for longer so it doesn't, because it takes longer for the heat to spread so they get burns. So that's why I don't go for spot bulbs, I go for um, floodlight bulbs. And that's why I've got them in domes because they can spread. So I've got that one which is a basking spot of 125 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is 51 degrees Celsius. And then I have another one, which is above a um, wooden platform, and that is 100 watt, again, in a dome, and that will get to, um, where are my notes? 110 degrees, which is 43 degrees Celsius. So she can pick more or less anywhere between there, as a basking spot. I think around the 120 mark is the sweet spot, but I found key, key, key 
for mangroves. I haven't kept any other Indicus complex, but I imagine it's the same. They need a cool spot. They need it. You can't have a cool spot of 82 that's too hot, in my opinion. She will seek out spots that are 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and she'll sleep there. And I've temperature gunned her, and she'll sleep there. And she'll come to the crack of the edge where I get a bit of a, the, a crack in the glass where I get a draft and she will sleep there. She, she does it. She has her nest box is heated. She can sleep in there, but she doesn't. She picks cold spots and she sleeps in cold spots. So I'm not just saying it. Get your mangroves cold. Have them hot, but it's very important that they can get cold. So her cage is 125 all the way down to around 70 during the day and then at night it goes down to the low 60s especially in the winter it definitely does in the winter in the summer it stays around 68 70 but that's important because in the wet season the temperature will be more or less stable but in the wet season they have cloud cover so the ambient air She's going to town. The ambient air is a lot more humid, a lot more dense because of the cloud cover, allowing the, the, the jungle, the rainforest, to cool down. And in the summer, which isn't the summer because the temperatures are still the same during the day, but they have a, um, a dry season, there's no cloud cover, so the water can evaporate, allowing the rainforest to be warmer as such um, because humidity does cool the air down. So... In their wet season, which is our winter, which is when I cycle her, they do get colder nights in the winter we do. Let's use the weather in our favour. So, yeah, that is it for the basking spots and that is it for the cold cold side, really. Um, I also have UVB. Of course, I have UVB. UVB on all monitors. Um, she has a UVI of 3.5 all the way down to zero in her nest box. She, there'll be no UVB penetration. Um, and then there she has that wedge spot, which is under the um, under the ply platform. And again, there's no UVI there. I checked with my solimeter, there's no UVI there, but under the basking spot, she can get to up to 3.5. Um, I also have an LED running parallel with the UVB of uh, 6,500 Kelvin LED baton to throw some ambient light. I have this side of the cage heated, lit, it's also heated, but this is the hot side with the lights going over, the LED going two thirds of the cage, the um, UVB going a third of the cage. And then this side has no lights at all, but it has lights in the sense of obviously the ambient lighting, but that side's more gloomy. So if she wants that dark, gloomy, she can go to this side. If she wants warmer, lighter areas, she can go to this side. She has multiple logs and corks that go this, that, this, that, and the other way so she can climb and lay. And I have like old fence posts in there that she can more on set up this is. But that, so it's flat so she can climb. It looks natural because I found it in a forest that knocked down. But she can lay flat on it and I have big branches in there. I've got a couple of little branches so she can use those muscles to climb on the little branches because it takes a different type of fitness to pull yourself across a small branch than it does to pull yourself across a big branch. It's like if we laid on the floor and commando crawled, it'd be easy because the floor is flat. If we had to do it over little branches, we'd have to use our tummy muscles. So it's important to have that silly stuff in there because it just helps keep a defined fit monitor. I think she's still trying to lay. Oh well, I hope she's trying to lay because she's digging everywhere and it's not like her. Um, especially not at this hour at night because the light's been off for a couple of hours now. So yeah, um... Actually, speaking of that, I never really spoke about this. Um, lighting cycles. I have lighting cycle in the summer for 14 hours, and then in the winter, I have 10 hours. So 14 hours off in the winter, 10 hours on. And then in the summer, I have 14 hours on, 10 hours off. And I slowly transition that as clocks and stuff sort of go back. Um, some people have it exactly the same. I just change it, just more or less. I'll change it over the space of like an hour, over the space of a month, and within two or three months it changes. So, yeah, that's pretty much that. But you definitely want the LED because it gives you full spectrum lighting. Full spectrum lighting allows that monitor to 
really get his brain thinking, really see its environment for what it is, as well as the UVB. Um, so it can metabolize calcium, so you don't get any issues like MBD. And you don't have to worry about over-supplementing um, D3. It's because you've got UVB and your lizard can do it for you. Um, well, I don't know what I wrote. Oh, yeah, they seek out the cold. I said that. So now we're going to touch briefly on humidity. Um, 65 to 90%. 90% will be down in her nest box and burrow. She'll definitely be able to find 90% in there because it's moist. Not wet, but moist soil. As well as... Um, going off into the cooler side of the cage around the bottom it's going to be around 70 percent humidity as well as i spray her three to four times a week that will help the humidity aid the humidity and i soak her in the wet season so that our winter soak the absolute hell out of her summer i spray her maybe once or twice a week i dry her out and what i do in the winter is i spray it at night um as well as during the day but i spray it at night because then it spikes humidity at night simulating that what they were um what they would be susceptible to in the wild and especially when you have a wild caught animal you need to try and replicate the wild as best you can um you can go on a website called timeofdate.com and follow the weather patterns um because she doesn't she doesn't know like i say she's from the wild she's not from a box she doesn't know if she's coming or going um and their southern hemisphere we're northern hemis hemisphere so their body clock's like way out of whack so you need to get them into a routine as such and keep trying to keep them to it because it probably doesn't do well on their psyche um so yeah she's just so cool i just i could sit in her and watch her all day um she's just currently sat minding her own business she does look quite skinny but she's only on 19 days last time she was on 24 days but we'll get into that in a minute i'm taking a tangent so another good thing that can help you with humidity is like i've said before make sure your substrate is covered by leaves or some like bark chippings or something like that because it stops the moisture escaping especially if the substrate's heated in my case it's not so it's important to turn the substrate because otherwise it will get stagnant so every fortnight i go in there i churn it all around just because i don't want to get that substrate to get all horrible and grotty because it even if it's heated it's good to turn it but because it's not heated water will sit it will go down and it'll sit so obviously a sealed vivarium make sure you've got your um animal safe silicon all the way around the vivarium and then nice and hot basking spots with water creates humidity and the big water bowl helps as well um which should be heated so that'll help with the humidity in the ambience as well as obviously if she goes into the water she's got 100 percent humidity there and sometimes she does sleep in it and i worry that she's going to get like water blisters or something but she never does um yeah, I don't know what she's doing. She's just digging around at the minute, bless her. So, we're going to touch on food now. Let me know if you're enjoying a man rambling about a lizard for 33 minutes. So this is the best part about owning a mangrove monitor. They go crazy for food. She's amazing to feed. She jumps, she launches herself, she runs around everything is food and because i don't power feed her she's always hungry and she will always try she's knocked her um she's knocked her bark down and she's um she, i think she's looking to get back in her nest box so i'll fix that for in a bit but yeah so this is the best thing about them they're crazy this is why i enjoy her so much i can really i want to like create like an obstacle course for her so like when she comes out she can like go on this climb on that jump on this to get some food so yeah, what do I feed her? I feed her locusts, adult with the wings, because they just jump and flutter around and she loves it. She gets worms, she gets morio worms, so super worms, she gets roaches, she gets a whole manner of fish, she gets shrimp, she gets crabs, chicks, eggs, I fed her some octopus, quite cool. She gets like lobster and lardons, she gets mussels. Um, I do feed rodents, but not often. And if I'm feeding them, I tend to use rat pups because they're hairless and I don't really want to get hair in the digestive tract because it's just dirty. But they will eat them and they do love them. But yeah, very, 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 very diet is key with these guys. I don't feed anything like ground turkey or like beef and stuff. I go for whole prey. I don't go for ground up stuff. I know that's more common in America, but I just, it's, it, it's not cheap, but 
you don't get into getting to, you don't get into lizards if you're trying to skimp out on it, especially not a lizard like a mangrove monitor because they cost you a lot of money. Um, obviously, supplement with calcium. I don't use D3 because I have UVB and I have a solar meter to check that my UVB is in point. Um, and she gets multivitamin every other alternate feed. Um, especially when I think she's cycling, I will definitely hammer her harder with the calcium and the multivitamin to make sure she, her body has all she needs to um, be able to give me nice, gorgeous eggs. So, um, for she gets fed for me probably three times a week as a, as a normal, maybe. Um, and I'll feed her, depending on what I'm feeding her, but she always has worms and moria worms in the setup so she can forage, which I think is really important for the enrichment as well as um, just keeping her brain ticking over. If she's hungry, she can dig. It's natural. But, yeah, so I'll feed, I'll feed her four or five crabs that I've broken up. I'll feed her two or three lardons, like shrimps, whatever you want to call them, crayfish. Um, she would get a chick. She had a chick today, not a quail chick, a chick chick, and that's what she had today. But she hasn't been so at the. It's hard because she's. I think she's laying eggs at the moment because she's laying eggs at the moment. I feed her every day, but like something little, and she's getting close. She didn't eat yesterday or the day before. She wouldn't eat, so that even makes me think even more so that she's getting close. So I really want to get some more nutrition in her. So I knew she'd go for a chick. So I gave her a chick, and she did. Um, but during the up to laying eggs i feed her every day but just enough to so she's not and because all that extra food and those eggs in the tummy it's all going to sit on her so she, i just feed it every day and make sure that she's got a little bit of something in her rather than a big meal um but yeah i do food cycle her as well so in the summer i will starve her i'll maintenance feed her coming into the winter and as i get into the winter I will start to feed her a bit more and a bit more. And then um, I've got written down breeding time, but I forget. Mm. Between February and May is the normal breeding time of the um, mangrove monitor. And if she does lay for me, which is seeming like she's going to, it's going to be a double clutch. And um, I'll get into that on the breeding thing. I've sort of gone off tangent. But yeah, so I feed them... Um, as babies, you'd be feeding them every day, every other day as juveniles, going into three to four times a week as adults, me personally. And then, um, depending on what you're feeding, so if she got a chick and I'm not breeding her, I probably won't feed her again for four or five days because that chick is more than enough to sustain her. You want to check the lateral folds, make sure that they're nice and almost saggy. You don't want them to be, well, saggy is the wrong word. You want them to be like compressed so it's taut. If they're saggy and drooping, they're too skinny and if they're not there then they're too fat um she's still got them at the moment i think she's gone back in the nest box she's still got them at the moment which i'll get into on the egg stuff i'm going on tangents this is the best podcast ever um so yeah that's pretty much it on diet i would try and build a relationship with your mangrove try and tongue feed them um if you can tongue feed them then you can get them to come out because all they care about is food then you can get them to come out and you can start to socialize with that lizard and if you can socialize with the lizard that's probably one of the best things you can do because that allows you to build threads of trust so um i don't bother touching mango when i mango when i get her out i just sort of run around the floor a bit just so she's not just sitting and opening her mouth and feeding i like to keep her hungry for the chase as such um which leads me into enrichment because they are smart as hell but if I get her out and I get her to run around for food, sometimes she'll stop and she'll be like, this isn't my setup, like, what am I, what am I doing here? And her tongue will go. And that's just good for the psyche. It's good for her brain. I, um, I also, um, I don't have, like, the puzzle feeders that you can, that you've seen, um, when you think of a puzzle feeder, but I'm gonna get one. But I do do puzzle feeding. I, like, bury stuff or I will put it slightly under a rock or I will put it in, like, a toilet roll tube and then put that like upright so she got to like get her and hands in there and get her brain going so i do 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 stuff like that um as well as obviously the standard stuff like moving stuff around in her enclosure sorry she's like digging i'm getting distracted because i don't want to miss her laying eggs but again it's too early again paul podcast focus um 
So yeah, she's um she has things moved around in her setup as well as um silly stuff just like adding leaf litter or new textures, new smells, new tastes. Um moving where I put her favourite log, that elevated one there. There the moving that um that way, that way, moving it over moving the log that sort of sits that way across in the viv moving it like that way just silly stuff so when she comes up uh, wherever she's sleeping in the morning she'll go hey like what's all this then and it just gets her brain going i don't want to like drastically change it around i don't want to move everything around and then what i'll do is um what I'm, when i'm trying to feed her i'll um sort of make her fight for the food as such just so i don't want to do live feeding but that that stimulus of live feeding really is good for their brain so i'll like move it around and try and get it around let her pull it apart and um as well as just being present for your lizard like with mango it's a bit different you have to judge this in your own instance but with mango she's she doesn't really like it and she will charge the glass either a for food or b for defense and i don't want to stress her out so but you can sit there with your lizard and you can just be like, what's up, guy? You okay? And if it's a relatively calm one or if it's even if it's shy, that's fine. It's if, you've, if it's aggressive, then you're probably going to be stressing it out too much. And it's not probably not worth it. So pretty much it on enri enrichment. Taming, hard work, capital letters, exclamation marks I've put there. Pure evil I've put there. But like I said, I'm cool with that. I didn't get a mangrove monitor to cuddle. I've got Aki's to cuddle. So, but start with food. I've touched on it briefly over this, so I won't stay on this too much. But start with food. Food is the root to all, especially females, their hearts. Um, tongue feed up onto the hand. Straight the body. Let it go back in. Don't grab it. Worst thing you can do is come in as a bird, grab your mangrove monitor, restrain it. If you are going to do that, at least let it run through your hands. It's going to bite you, it's going to bite you. Don't end on a negative. If it bites you, don't put it back. Because then it's going to go, this is easy. This guy doesn't even want to deal with me. Or girl. Whoever wants to run a mangrove monitor. But they're naturally shy. They're a naturally shy, flighty species. Mango is a rarity because she bites. They don't often bite. But mango will not hesitate. And she has bitten my gloves several times. And I do wear gloves because I'm a girl. But like I say... I lose these, I can't work, I can't pay for the lizards, so I wear gauntlet gloves, those ones. Um, but yeah, ideally start from a baby, it's a lot easier said than done. Ideally start captive bred. If you're in America, consider yourself lucky, get on a list. They're amazing animals, I feel like captive bred ones will be a different ball game. Wild caught adults, no. Um, some of them, there's just don't get me wrong, she's, she's tame. She'll sit out in the viv. She doesn't hide from me. She doesn't run away and she tongue feeds. For me, that's tame. There's a difference between a tame monitor and a social monitor. She's not social at all. I don't think she ever will be. But I'm, I'm fine with that. I got her full well knowing that I would never be able to cuddle her. Like, you don't want to invest the time and energy into a mangrove monitor if you're thinking that you're going to end up with a puppy don't get me wrong they're out there but as a stereotype they're not that lizard they're just not that guy they're more likely to break let's put it that way they're more likely to just have their will broken rather than become tame but they they can i'm not saying they can't but in my opinion they're definitely more of a uh, display interact with when you're feeding rather than have it out and talk about a podcast um but they are shy so if you've got your mangrove monitor and it's a baby and you've put it in a glass box and it's buried and it's hidden and you can't see it don't what, what do you expect you know like put yourself don't anthropomorphize but put yourself in their shoes you've just been ripped out of the jungle and now you're in a tiny little box you're gonna hide there's so many new smells. It's strange. The temperature's different. The air, the air humidity's different. Like, 
your best friend around the corner that you normally go for like afternoon crickets with he's gone like where where are you so don't dig it out just leave it leave it to de-stress leave it to decompress leave food in there don't try and tong feed it the second day that you've got it it's the worst thing you're going to do for your lizard it's going to hate you i'm going to hate you like you're going to hate yourself just let your lizard be your lizard it's cool it's fine oh if you're worried ask don't just go in there digging it out because your lizard will take so many steps backwards that it'll either one it's will be broken or two it'll end up like mango and try and kill you a guy I got mango from, she was in a 4x2, something like that, and she had nothing but a red bulb in there. So no wonder she's evil, because she's come from the wild to that. He was building big enclosures, don't get me wrong, like a really nice guy, but for the psyche of mango, she's probably like, what the hell? So don't, don't think you're going to get a mango monitor and it's going to be your best friend. Speak to people like Kai, speak to myself, speak to people that have them and learn the cons of mangrove monitors because there's a lot. They're not these and may you see pictures of them like, oh yeah, I've got my new mangrove monitor, it's great. It's not, it's just petrified and you probably don't have it hot enough. That's just my two cents on that. Any animal can become tame. Mango is tame. She tongue feeds, she does what I need her to do. Can you get a social mangrove monitor? Of course you can. I've seen them. Are all mangrove monitors going to be social? Probably not. If you get a captive bred one and you work your absolute ass off with it from day one, it probably will be social. I would do that. So, yeah, just don't get bit if you need your fingers. They probably you won't lose a finger, but you need stitches. And when you do this for a living and like fiddly with wires, and you can't use your fingers, you're not going to earn much money. So. Last but not least, I think, breeding. I've never done it. Not going to comment. Cycling. I've done it. Twice. Once got eggs. Once didn't get eggs. She reabsorbed. And again, I'm pretty sure she's going to lay eggs. So, on the 2nd of May, 2020 one <laughs> um mango went off her food she bloated for 24 30 hours went back on her food completely normal nothing else changed around 14 to 18 days into after that she was digging a lot and i had her in a much lesser setup for laying because i didn't know she was a female so she reabsorbed her eggs. I didn't know that then, but I now know that now. On the 10th of March this year, she wouldn't eat. A bit strange. She loves her food. Okay. She bloated for 32 hours and she was off her food for 32 hours. And then she went straight back onto food and she was crazy for it. And I mean crazy for it. And I was like, okay. And then this is where it got tricky because she didn't go back off her food. And she didn't get huge. She got plump, but I assumed it's because I was feeding her a little bit more and more frequently. And then she laid, and I didn't know that she laid in the sense of her body. And this is why it's important to keep them lean. And ma Mango's not fat at all. I'm going to big myself up here. She's in great shape. Um, and she, she didn't slim down much at all. But she disappeared for a couple of days and hadn't seen her for a couple of days. And then she, then I saw her and she hadn't slimmed down, but the base of her tail was a little bit more sunk than normal. And I'm talking a little bit more sunk than normal. And they can take moisture and energy out of that tail base to produce eggs. And she was hitting the glass a bit different to normal. And I was like, I wonder. So 23 days after noticing the stop of food, Mango gave me three perfect eggs. Well, two were clearly sucks. One looked amazing. Sadly, that egg is no longer with us, but we will try again. 16th of May, 19 days ago, as recording to this podcast, Mango went off her food and she bloated. 
And now, 19 days later, Mango, she's back in her nest box now, but Mango has been, she went off, she didn't want food a couple of days ago. She had a chick today, but she didn't go off food last time. So I'm not too worried about that. But Mango, she's not looking plump. She's she's still looking fairly lean, like her normal self. But she's sort of just working, walking around and she's digging in random spots and she's spending a lot more time in her nest box. So I... In three or four days, I'm going to go hunting for eggs. Hopefully, I've got it right. So, what I do is, like I said, in the winter, I have cooler nights. I let I have no nighttime temp, no nighttime heating. I let her get down. I have wetter nights. Spray her at night. I have wetter days. Um, and then from October, November, I'll start to increase food. And I'll slowly decrease it again as we get into May and June. I think it's a bit late in the season because we're um, coming into June. But I think what happens is if they have eggs and you heavy feed, it triggers them into another cycle. I didn't want to do that. But I also wanted to make sure that she'd replenished the energy she took into her eggs. So after this, what I'll do is I'll just give her, a, say, a chick. And then I will just feed her lesser foods of high calcium like shrimps and prawns and lobsters and stuff like that to try and not get her to go and cycle again which I don't think she will but I don't want her to cycle again and what I want her to do is just maintain that body weight and then as we get into I was planning June, July, August, September sort of starve her down um, but it'll be July depending if she lays or not it'll be July I'm noticing my mouse been weird this whole podcast um, it'd be July, August, September, I'll be maintenance feeding her, and then as we get into October, November, starting to increase the food and the humidity, and then as we go through to January, I'll be really starting to hit her with food, and hopefully to trigger the cycle again, to get me that parthenogenic egg, which will probably be, be a boy, and I don't know if I'll breed it back to mango, but I'll take that, and I will love and adore him, and I don't know what I'll call him, but it's going to happen, and I will produce a mangrove monitor, um, I think that's pretty much it really, that's all my notes anyway, so 50, 53 minutes, 52 minutes, so yeah, mangrove, mangrove monitors are great, like don't get me wrong, I love mine, they're just not something you can go into blindly, they're not as amazing as some people make them out to be, because I don't want to shoot myself here, but I'm going to, you either got really lucky, and the amount of posts I see about it, there's a lot of lucky people in the world. Or you might have your care correct. It's not might not be you, but your lizard might just be traumatised. And that's why it seems so social. But if it's trying to run from you, it's not social. It's scared. There's a massive difference. I've got through 53 minutes without having to sniff and I've got a blocked nose because hay fever. And it is now nearly 12 o'clock at night. Haha. <laughs> um, so I hope you enjoyed. If you didn't, I'm sorry. If you got this far, comment, subscribe, please. Um, let me know what you want to see. I hopefully want to do a QA. and a So I'm going to compile a few questions over the next couple of weeks. I'll post them on my Instagram story. Paul's monitors. Give me a follow. Um... Yeah, just let me know you want to see. Let me know if you enjoyed. If you didn't, I'm sorry. This is just basically the basic brief overview of mangrove monitors. Just rough stuff. Nothing really. Just I want to like try and get into things and do a bit more like deep diving of like behaviour and stuff rather than just sort of like because I'm sort of addressing these podcasts more to like beginners. Like if you're thinking about getting this lizard, listen to this and it'll hopefully give you a better idea and understanding of its needs this isn't a care guide but it is a care guide but you still need to do loads of other research um so that's what i was sort of aiming these videos at but i want to try and do a bit more deep dive um let me know if you want to see an actual tour of my mangrove monitor setup and then i can i probably will do one because then i can do a um a before and after when i've given her the nice like suplex duplex whatever you want to call it plex um 
But yeah, part of me wants to ramble for six minutes to get my first hour podcast, but I'm not going to bother because it's tired and I'm it's tired and I'm sleepy. <laughs> it's late and I'm tired. Um, so thank you again for the support. This will be out Monday. So I'll catch you all next Monday, if not before, with another random video. So I'll catch you all next Monday for the next episode of the Captive Raptors podcast. Um, we've got... I don't think you can see... We've got merch. It's not it's not for sale, it's just for me to wear to the gym. But we've got merch. Um we're gonna get a custom logo design as well, which is gonna be absolutely sick. So stay tuned for that. Again, appreciate all the love and support. This has been me, Paul. That's been you, you. Love you bye. <laughs>